Great. I'm a little shorter. OK, so all programs can induce memory fragmentation when they run, where a program requires dramatically more memory from the operating system than the sum of live objects in the heap. Now, in garbage collected languages like Java, C Sharp, uh, JavaScript, uh, this is this is not a problem, right? Because this is this is solved with something called heap compaction. And the reason, uh, one of the reasons that uh, these languages can perform heap compaction is because the runtime itself is the sole arbiter of references and uh, and can precisely identify references in memory. So let's just uh, review real quick what this compaction looks like. We have operating system pages, we have uh, live objects on these pages, and then we have references between objects. And when a runtime wants to uh, reclaim memory, it moves objects closer together, uh, and then it updates every single reference to these moved objects. Once it has freed up some pages so that there are no longer live objects on them, uh, it can return that page to the operating system, uh, where the operating system can hand it off to another process, or even hand it back to us as a process for use in a different size class. Unfortunately, there are a lot of programs out there uh, today that people use that are not written in garbage collected languages. These include our databases, uh, our web browsers, our operating systems, uh, even implementations of dynamic languages like Python and Ruby that are uh, the interpreters for these languages are written in C. And uh, all of these programs are actually written in C or C++ where compaction is, is not possible. Programmers in these languages uh, compile their code down to uh, machine code. Uh, oftentimes they uh, compile code down without debug information or even symbols. And when they run these programs, uh, the C runtime or, or runtime libraries in general don't have ways to precisely distinguish pointers from integers. This is why uh, uh, garbage collectors for C and the past, like the Boeing GC, uh, are both conservative and non-moving. But this isn't just, uh, you know, a, a lack of some type information at runtime. Uh, C and C++ let programmers do lots of creative things, like store flags in the low bits of aligned addresses, um, uh, as well as lots of other uh, uh, fun things you see out in the wild. In addition to these implementation challenges, we have uh, strong theoretical results as well that show that non-moving allocators are subject to catastrophic fragmentation in the worst case. Which brings us to Mesh. Mesh is able to provide compaction without relocation for C and C++ applications for the first time. Uh, we do this without requiring applications to have code changes or even recompilation. Uh, applications can just LD preload libmesh uh, or link against their library and uh, and run. Uh, for an application like Firefox, uh, when we run it under libmesh and we run a well-known web benchmark uh, called speedometer, uh, we see a 17% reduction in average heap size with under 1% uh, impact on the performance of that benchmark. Redis is a popular in-memory key value store uh, where fragmentation is such a problem that they actually developed their own uh, domain-specific compaction uh, algorithm that, uh, that they call active defragmentation. Mesh is able to recover as much memory as this domain-specific approach. And actually, uh, when running Mesh, the time spent compacting the heap is five times, uh, we're able to compact the heap five times quicker than, uh, than their solution. And so in the rest of the talk, I want to go over three things. The first is the mechanism we use to compact the heap together. Uh, the next is uh, our use of randomization in our allocator. And finally, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about how we actually find sets of pages to compact. So we call the mechanism uh, that we use to compact the heap uh, meshing, which is compaction without uh, virtual relocation. And we consider two pages to be eligible for, for this type of compaction when two things hold. Uh, these pages have objects of the same size class in them, and they have non-overlapping object offsets. Uh, that is, if you uh, count the offset from the start of the page for each live object, the sets of these offsets are disjoint. Uh, and so uh, let's walk through what this looks like. Uh, on the top here, we have the virtual pages that programs interact with through pointers. 
Uh, and on the bottom, we have the physical pages where objects are stored in memory. So the first thing we do on meshing, uh, when we have two pages that are eligible for this uh, technique, we mark one of them as read-only so that any concurrent threads in the program uh, don't, uh, don't update objects while we are, uh, are compacting them. Uh, next, we copy objects from one physical page to the other while maintaining the offsets uh, of those objects from the start of the page. Next, we're able to uh, actually update the page tables of the application uh, with a call to mmap. Uh, and this is possible because the uh, arena that we're using for the heap is a in-memory temporary file that we get from MF memfd create on Linux uh, and is mapped in with the map shared flag. And the full details of this are in the paper. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about them afterwards as well. Now that we have both of these virtual pages pointing at the same physical page, uh, we can mark that second page as read-write again, and concurrent mutators can sort of continue on their merry way. Uh, we can now return this uh, uh, otherwise unused physical page back to the operating system, which again can uh, pass it off to another program, or it can give it back to us for use in a different size class. And uh, we didn't have to change or harm any virtual addresses in this technique. So now that we have a mechanism for, um, for doing this compaction, it's, it's a little bit easy to imagine uh, worst case scenarios. And in particular, uh, you could imagine a case where we have uh, many low occupancy pages that are not meshable because they have uh, one or several objects at the same offsets, uh, where we would not be able to reclaim any memory from this technique. And this isn't just a theoretical problem. We're actually able to write a really simple, uh, we were able to write uh, in our paper a really simple Ruby program that uses some functional programming idioms to, uh, to generate regular allocation patterns like this. Uh, and if we run this program under mesh with randomization disabled, we're not able to recover any memory from, uh, uh, through compaction like this. But we are if we do enable randomization. And to give uh, maybe a little bit more idea of uh, part of how this happens, in non-randomized allocators, which are most allocators, uh, especially during program startup, if you, um, if you ask for several objects in a row of the same size from the allocator, you get uh, several addresses in memory that are next to each other. And what randomization is going to let us do is ensure that live objects are uniformly distributed uh, within pages in the heap. And this has been done in previous allocators, uh, uh, often for some allocators that uh, care about security. Uh, and the, the typical approach is using something called random probing, where we generate an offset, we check to see if that offset's free, and if so, we return a pointer. Otherwise, we try again. And in expectation, this is actually quite fast, uh, as long as we keep occupancy below some threshold for these pages. But uh, uh, unfortunately, this is like at odds with what we're trying to solve with mesh, right, which is uh, minimizing heap size and maximizing usage of these pages. So to solve this, we introduced uh, a new data structure called the shuffle vector to provide fast random allocation while fully utilizing all of those pages that we have. And the way this works is that we first load the offsets from a page into a thread local, uh, thread local array uh, that we call a shuffle vector. And then we uh, shuffle these uh, offsets. We uh, run an iteration, or we run the Fisher-Yates shuffle to get a random permutation of these offsets, so that when an application calls malloc, we can just do bump pointer style allocation, take the first offset that's free off of this uh, array, um, do some simple math to reconstruct a pointer from it, and hand that back to the application. And when they free, uh, free a pointer in the future, we're able to just reverse this math Get a, uh, get a pointer back from it, stick it back on the array, and then we perform uh, one round of the shuffle. So we, we swap it with another offset chosen uniformly at random in the array uh, to ensure that even if a program is allocating and freeing in a loop, uh, we, we distribute their objects across pages, which ensures that when we get into a situation where we have lots of low occupancy pages, uh, we can uh, uh, we can have confidence that we will be able to recover uh, recover a lot of memory from this situation. Which brings us to how we actually find these pages to mesh. And to state it a little bit more formally, what we want to do is at a given point in time, 
release the maximum number of pages that we can back to the operating system. And there's just a, a, few little, a few little wrinkles here, right? The first one is that we run this in the free slow path. Um, and this is uh, to ensure that we work uh, without modification for any uh, existing program. Uh, we run it at most every 100 milliseconds to both amortize the cost of what we're doing, uh, as well as to ensure that we're not doing needless work, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it would be bad to, to perform a bunch of work to compact the heap if the program is immediately going to free the rest of those objects that we've just compacted. And finally, we treat each size class independently here. So uh, the way that we went about thinking this is by modeling the heap as a graph, where each node in the graph is a page, a partially full page in the heap. And we have an edge between these, these pages if there's a meshing relationship, if we could uh, uh, mesh those two pages together uh, to reclaim memory. And so one way you could imagine solving this uh, is through a, a related problem, min clique cover, um, which is uh, a little bit alarming because this is a, a known hard problem. Uh, and uh, suggesting we solve something like that in a memory allocator doesn't seem like a great idea. So luckily, um, due to the fact that we use random randomization, uh, as well as some other details that are in the paper, uh, we actually show that we can solve a much simpler graph problem, uh, matching, uh, and end up with a very good result in terms of the amount of pages that we free back to the operating system. The, the remaining hurdle that we have to jump over here is just that if we tried to actually uh, build this graph in memory and run an existing algorithm on it, uh, the amount of space that it would require to, to represent this would actually dwarf the amount of space that we would um, that we would get back through meshing. So uh, we came up with a uh, an algorithm called split mesher, a randomized algorithm that approximates matching without having to materialize this graph. And the way it works is that it takes a set of partially full pages as input, uh, yields uh, pairs of pages that would be meshed together. And it takes that, that uh, set of input pages, splits them into two lists, and then just marches down and compares uh, items on the left to items on the right uh, to see if they are meshable. When it gets to the bottom of this list, we start again at the top, incrementing the offset on the right by one, uh, and continuing down and comparing again. And we do this, um, this looping a fixed number of times. And when we find a pair of pages that can be meshed together, uh, we remove them from the list, set them off to the side to return in the future, and continue on. And uh, we show that actually this algorithm uh, runs in uh, order, or run it, runs in O of n over q time. Uh, so it's linear with respect to the size of the heap. Uh, and q here is uh, the, the global probability that two spans will mesh. Uh, and we also have proofs in the paper that show that this is uh, an approximation that's arbitrarily close to one half uh, with high probability of the matching um, of matching. And so just coming back to the uh, results that we looked at briefly at the beginning, uh, uh, just to reiterate here, um, we do like as well uh, with this general approach as application specific uh, compaction techniques. Um, on the right here is compaction time. On the left is insert time uh, in, in the benchmark that we ran for Redis. Uh, this is largely governed by um, largely governed by uh, uh, malloc and free times, uh, malloc and free uh, uh, performance. We perform well on Firefox as well. And, and just to reiterate, like we're able to, uh, uh, one of the neat side effects here is we're able to provide compaction to other languages that just happen to be implemented in C and C++ that don't have moving garbage collectors like Ruby. So check out libmesh.org for our implementation, which is up on GitHub. Uh, thank you very much. Tanvir from University of Michigan. Really cool work based on a very simple idea that I can understand. Thanks, uh, me too. But my question here is that, uh, suppose your object or class size is less than 64 bytes, which is the general cache line size. If your class or object size is less than cache line size, will this mesh compaction introduce false sharing? 
um so the question is if you have objects that are smaller than the cache size do we introduce false sharing ah it's possible but i guess what i would say is that i think any general purpose allocator for c or c plus plus can introduce false sharing because you can end up with pages um partially full pages that were filled up on on one thread and then passed to another thread ah after some things have been freed so i think this yes but it's unclear sort of um how much that happens in practice i think in most of the cases if like your object size is less than is greater than 64 bits then it won't be any problem in true thank you hi um i have a question you said that your allocator caused less than a one percent performance increase right mm -hmm. on the programs you're running i was wondering if you thought about data locality when you randomize where all these you know regular allocations go in the pages how does that affect kind of how the program might you know, yeah. Has some idea of how it's going to allocate them. So, so that's a good question. The, the question was about how we uh, impact data locality. Uh, and I think what I would say is that uh, most of the programs we've seen and most of the benchmarks we've run, uh, we also run uh, spec in the paper. Um, uh, data locality doesn't seem to matter as much between objects. Uh, where programs really care about data locality, they end up allocating objects as a single array, uh, which uh, you know, by definition, is next to each other in memory. Thanks. I have basically the same question, but I was going to ask specifically about hardware prefetching, since this seems to get directly in the way of traversing a singly linked list, for example. Interesting. Um, I don't know if I've thought too much about hardware prefetching on that. Uh, as part of our allocator design, we we seg we segregate metadata from the heap itself, uh, and that. Uh, does have a problem with um, hardware prefetching and things like that, um, uh, which matter a lot on micro benchmarks and slightly less on real applications, as far as we can tell. Yeah. OK, so you don't have a good intuition about why it doesn't have a more I, just... uh, I don't, and I would love to talk about it. OK. okay. Catherine McKinley, very nice work. Thank you. So once you've meshed the two pages together, then you don't want to allocate on the shared, like in the spot you just meshed, but you still have a few spots left. Yep. So, so do you update the shuffle vectors to account for the fact that that object is essentially allocated now? Yeah, so, so we have shuffle vectors for sort of fast thread local allocations, and then we have sort of canonical bitmaps that represent the free spaces on a page. And when we merge things together, we make sure to update those uh, bitmaps. And we also make sure to never actually uh, mesh something where its offsets are actively in a shuffle vector. OK, so once you've, uh, once you've updated those bit vectors, yep. now you have uh, redundant, redundant information about each page, right? because it's full here and it's full here. And now when everything goes free, how do you know that you, you can get the whole page back? Um, we, we keep track of uh, one bitmap per physical page. So, so when we mesh, we sort of uh, combine the bits into a, single, uh, a okay. single piece of metadata and then throw the old one out. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great.